Greetings, I'm Eddie Muller, president of the Film Noir Foundation and one of the hosts of Turner Classic Movies. And I'm Jacqueline Stewart, Eddie's co-host and colleague at TCM and professor of cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. We are excited to be presenting to you the recently restored film version of Richard Wright's Native Son, made in Argentina in 1950, a film that until now has been a significant missing piece of cinema history, especially African-American cinema. Thank you both for joining me today. Eddie, good to see you again. Jacqueline, I am just so thrilled to meet you. I'm a silent film fanatic and uh, watch Silent right. Sunday, a TCM fanatic. So That's meeting awesome. you now is, is wonderful. So thank you for joining me. I'm glad. I'm glad. Really, really nice to meet you too. Uh, well, let's talk about Native Son. Uh, Jacqueline, Made in Argentina in 1950, it's a, a significant piece of cinema that's been missing, especially for the African-American experience. Yes, I mean, this is a film that has always um, uh, kind of seemed really obscure and, and unique. And when we look at not just like African-American cinema writ large from the 19 teens to now, but this mid-century period, it really seemed like this kind of like dead period. We know that there were black filmmakers making what we call race movies, people like Oscar Michaud who were active kind of through the 1940s. And then we think about black exploitation picking up in the early seventies, but that period in between, it was like, what was going on? Where was the black filmmaking? Where was the black artistry in film? So Native Son is such an important film in that regard alone because we have the voice of one of the most important American writers, certainly African-American writers, who is actualizing this blockbuster novel in the form of a film in 1950. Eddie, this the incredible story behind the creation of the film and its restoration. I mean, you had a special screening in Argentina by a cinephile, which ultimately led you to the Library of Congress? Uh, not exactly. It was actually, it's even more complicated. More complicated. Uh, it, it was, uh, yes, my, my colleague Fernando Martin Pena in Buenos Aires, when I was there, he mentioned to me uh, that he had a 16 millimeter copy of the film that he believed was the only complete copy of the film in existence that, that he knew of. Um, and he had uh, sent it to the Library of Congress in the hopes that it could be restored. So when I was doing my Noir City Film Festival in Silver Spring, Maryland at the AFI Theater there, um, I was contacted by a man named Edgardo Krebs, who is really the person most responsible for the resurrection of the film. Uh, Edgardo sort of made it his life's work to uh, resurrect the film and tell the story of its creation. And uh, he arranged a special screening of the film for me at the AFI Cinema uh, in, you know, outside Washington, D.C. And I, I was very surprised uh, because the only other person attending that screening besides Edgardo and Todd Hitchcock, the programmer at AFI, was uh, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, who had worked as the assistant director on the film and was two times the president of Bolivia, which, which was kind of intriguing. So I'm sitting there watching this film with, you know, the, the ex-president of Bolivia. Um, but anyway, the, that, that's sort of how it, it began. My connection to the film began. Um, and, and mostly I was just responsible for once there was a, a good uh, restored print of the film, I showed it at, at all of my festivals, I'm going to say seven or eight years ago, because I thought it, in addition to being a landmark for all of the socio-political reasons that we've discussed, and, and that the book obviously is a landmark in African-American literature and American literature, really, um, I, I thought it was a film noir. And that it, and that it fit very much into my framework. So I thought it was interesting that I, I don't want to say by default because I was very active in it, but it, that's just how people started seeing the film was it at my festivals. I remember in San Francisco, I showed it on a double bill with Intruder in the Dust. And I thought that was kind of interesting because you had Richard Wright and William Faulkner 
uh, and these two really um, incredible African American central characters. And um, anyway, uh, that, that's that's how that sort of came into being. And, and Jacqueline, uh, write stories. Wright always sent scripts and stories, but he was always being rejected. He was trying to break into Hollywood. Yeah, Richard Wright was a huge movie fan. I mean, it's not totally surprising. Americans were huge movie fans. This is a period when people are going to the movies every week, right? Multiple times per week. It's part of basic American culture. Um, and there's always been a thriving African-American film fandom. And he was very much a part of that. He's also an intellectual. So that's interesting that, um, that someone who took writing and art so seriously was also such a fan of mass media. But absolutely, in fact, I'd say that when you read the novel Native Son, you can see that it has cinematic qualities to it. Um, the way that he visualizes the action, um, the pace of the story at some of the key kind of action moments. Um, it's a wonderful scholar, Ellen Scott talks about the kind of like light and dark metaphors in the novel, the kind of chiaroscuro that we associate with film noir cinematography, you actually see that in the novel already. And so Richard Wright was actively thinking about this as a film, even as he was writing it as a novel. And he did, he was, you know, uh, consistently trying to figure out ways that he could be a Hollywood writer. And in that he wasn't alone, Langston Hughes wanted to write for Hollywood. Zora Neale Hurston wanted to write for Hollywood. Um, you know, they did not have the Hollywood careers that if we imagine just how extraordinary that would have been, but we can definitely see how the movies were shaping his thinking. And, um, and then that gives, I think this film some really interesting nuances too, because some of it is drawing on the cinematic stuff in the novel already. But then uh, he and Chanel are also doing a lot of other things solving problems and coming up with creative visual solutions for things as they're ado adopting and adapting the text. And Eddie, there was no way this film could be ever produced in the United States. And when it finally came to the States, it was a critical failure. Censored butchered the film. And it was a long journey to, to complete uh, The Native Son as it was originally. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I mean, that that's why it it it's sad when I hear you know, Jackie describing how these uh, these writers wanted to work in Hollywood. It was so easy for so many people to work in Hollywood in the 1930s. I mean, if you were a newspaper man, a playwright, a novelist, a, a public relations person, or just somebody who'd lived and had stories to tell, you were invited in to tell your stories in Hollywood, but not if you were black. and you know, that, that's why in this saga that Richard Wright uh, had to go first to France, where he first met Pierre Chanel, who would end up directing the movie. Uh, and then, um, you know, Chanel had left uh, France to go to Argentina during the war, where he continued his filmmaking and invited Wright to come from France to Buenos Aires to, to actually uh, write the screenplay with him and star in the film. So, but you're absolutely right. Um, it could not have been made in the United States, not only for the racial uh, aspect of it, but the political aspect of it. The film gets into some very hot button political issues uh, that were very timely at, at that era. And uh, there was no way that an American film was gonna touch on this stuff. So obviously they were counting on the money that was going to come from distribution in the United States. But when they realized that almost 40 minutes was going to be cut out of the film that was unacceptable for American audiences, uh, that that cut them to the quick and had a lot to do with the film's uh, failure outside of Argentina. It's, it's funny how Native Son was preserved by private collectors. How many stories are out there of films that have vanished or are incomplete, but then you scour the world and someone has a print of it in one country and another print in where, and Native Son, that's how it happened. We found 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter prints to complete uh, Richard Wright's vision. Yeah, I mean, this happens all the time. And there are some, you know, a lot of really interesting examples. There was a whole expedition uh, to New Zealand where a number of films, American films were discovered. I think, 
you know, we often think about films having like one authoritative version, but we have to remember that there are hundreds and hundreds of copies of films sometimes that were circulating all over the country and then all over the world. And all kinds of things could happen to these prints. If you remember the movie Cinema Paradiso, where the projectionist was the one who was sort of the censor cutting things out. Like if you think about these as material objects that travel around sometimes just through damage, but other times through censorship, um, that there are actually multiple versions of many of our favorite films, sometimes by accident and sometimes by design. So it's one of the really exciting things about working in film history and film preservation that I think we're always looking for additional materials, holding out hope that there will be scraps of films or sometimes entire films that we think were lost that are actually extant. And it's wonderful to have an institution like the Library of Congress, which did such a masterful restoration of this film to really try to give us more of a sense of what the original film. Now the DVD release from Kino Lober, Definitive Vision uh, from the best sourced elements finally arrives. Yes, and uh, you know, our goal is that, you know, this is now up online streaming. People can actually watch this gorgeous restoration but when uh, the full digital package is published, I'm very excited about it because uh, I'm actually producing special features that will include the complete backstory of the history of the book, uh, Richard Wright, the making of the film. Uh, it, it's a pretty extraordinary story that I think it, uh, Jackie and I talk about this all the time. This is what we do on TCM. It's like, how do you provide sufficient context so that people can really understand what they're looking at? And I will admit that with Native Son, there are some things about the film that, that will not work for a contemporary viewer if they just watch the film cold. Uh, you know, Richard Wright's performance is is somewhat amateurish because guess what? He's an amateur as an actor. Yes. And, and it's odd to watch a film that is so gorgeously designed. The production design is extraordinary. The cinematography is fabulous. Uh, it looks and feels very much like this missing film noir with an amateur actor starring in it. Right, so there's the, on the plus side, there's this fabulous uh, serendipitous thing where how often do you actually see the author of a literary classic portray the central character in the book? That's just so bizarre that it's, you know, uh, thank God it's preserved. But on the other hand, it's awkward because you can't help but think, wow, somebody a little younger and a little more adept should be playing this part. I mean, Richard Wright was 40 years old, you know, when he did this film and the character is a very young man. And it, it's, you have to just suspend disbelief and, and go with the film and what it's saying. And I'm in no way apologizing because I think it's a very, very good movie. But I do understand that some people are going to say, man, this guy's no actor. And it's like, yeah, you're right. He's, he's not, he's, He's the guy who wrote the book. Yeah. And could I add to that, that the fact that it's shot in Argentina, but it's supposed to be the South side of Chicago. Yes. That some of the actors are clear their lines are, you know, dubbed because it's, you know, there, there's this attempt to try to make this feel like an American story, even though it's not shot in that context. So what Eddie is saying about the importance of providing context is absolutely important because if you see it cold, there's just so many things about it that seem just a little off, but once you know the whole story, it's just remarkable that this film got made at all and that it looks like the kind of like mashup of black fiction and noir that um, that really gives this story, I think, uh, new life. I could totally- You know, I, I just, I just, I, I wanna add one thing to, to what Jackie just said that I think is really, really important. Um, when I wrote my first book on film noir, which is, you know, 22 something years ago now, I, I would go out and do film screenings. And from the very beginning, I would have uh, African-American patrons 
approach me and say, are there any noir films starring black people, right? I mean, this, this was a long time ago and I didn't know the answer, right? I said, well, I know that there are contemporary films that are clearly, you know, riffing on classic noir. I mean, you look at stuff like Dead Presidents and New Jack City and all this stuff, uh, you know, that's an updated version of classic film noir. But I really didn't know of anything from that time period when, you know, the classic noir era that fit that bill. So discovering this film, uh, you know, that's why I say it, it's like this incredibly crucial missing link in film history. And, uh, and, and now I think it's fabulous to be able to say, yeah, there was an African-American noir and it couldn't be made in the United States of America. And I, I, That's kind of a sad time, commentary. Yeah, and this was the first time I had seen the film. And uh, you're right, without the historical context and the story behind it, it can put off a lot of viewers not understanding uh, its, you know, its origin story. So, well, both of you, thank you so much for your dedication and uh, for your insightful uh, history on this film. It's very important. I can. Uh, recommend it to a lot of people now because I'm always having people asking me for classic film noir and here's something that's unique and I think they're going to enjoy it and uh, especially with the incredible story behind it from not only its making but also the restoration so thank you both for joining me today thank you Jeff thank you